So I'm Jason Daggett. Uh, I work here in Portland over actually just like two blocks that way at Galois. Um, we're also hiring. Check out our webpage. Um, so I wasn't sure when, when, this was, when this group was first announced what kind of topics would be interesting to people. But I already had this talk prepared, so um, I asked people if they'd be interested. A few people wrote in and said yes. So if, if you uh, aren't interested in, in ancient CPUs, you can blame those people. <laughs> And I guess me too for preparing the talk. <laughs> so the, um, the 6502 is interesting because it was kind of the, uh, the first microprocessor that was successful and, and really allowed the personal computer revolution to happen. It, you know, very few people are using them these days, but you know, back in the day, every, every device that you would own had one of these guys. And I, I think the markings on there, um, you can kind of read them. So the letters, the first row uh, is supposed to say MOS, the, the company that, that designed it. And then the CPU number, uh, it's revision A. And I forgot how to read the last line, but I think it's basically this was made in the first quarter of 83. All right, so, so the story starts back uh, uh, in, in the early 70s. Um, Motorola uh, wanted to make a microprocessor. Uh, these were not common back then. I think their project might have been the first real microprocessor that wasn't just um, like a, a, a calculator chip. And uh, they, they hired Chuck Peddle um, to, to sort of be the, the lead, the technical lead for the project. And uh, previously he had worked at a company where they designed things like um, uh, systems to electronically take payments for gas stations and they didn't think to patent it, so um, you know he could have become quite wealthy from that. Uh, but instead, he uh, he uh, put that business aside, took a job at Motorola, and thought to himself, "Oh, when, once I uh, you know kind of figure out how things work at Motorola, then I'll I'll leave and go back to my company and 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 revive it and and be successful." But uh, I don't think he ever went back to that company. So one of the things that he did a lot while he was there. Would, he would go out and meet with companies like Ford, and he would tell them, like, we have this amazing thing called a microprocessor, and it's going to change, you know, all of your product lines because you can incorporate this in your designs, and it's all these, you know, amazing, wonderful things you'll be able to do. And you know, they'd, they'd be on the edge of their seat. Wow, this is really great. You know, tell us more. And you know, they get to the end, and they'd say, you know, and how much is this going to cost? And he would say, uh, three hundred dollars. And and in in you know 1974, uh, you know that's equivalent to about what's that 1300 in by 2010. Um, I'm not ha sure how accurate that is. I used kind of a, a website for for tracking inflation, and and that's what they told me. So so that's kind of a lot to add to you know every design. You know another 1300 dollars. So then he would ask them, well you know, if you could set the price, you know what would you uh, pay for it? And they said, well. You know, we could we could add another twenty five dollars to the cost, and that that wouldn't be so bad. And and so, uh, you know, at some point he realized, oh, you know, we really uh, we got to lower the price, and and he got kind of frustrated because he went to his management, and they said, you know, they're thinking, wow, you know, we we can't lower the price anymore. We're already not going to be profitable with this product. Like, you know, twenty five dollars. That's that's ridiculous. That's you know a tenth of what we're charging now. And so they kind of they told him to you know take a hike sort of thing. So, so uh, Chuck, uh, Bill Mensch, that I'll, I'll talk about more, and then six other um, talented engineers, they all decided to leave Motorola. Um, and, and it was really like Chuck deciding to leave uh, really made the other engineers go, oh, do I want to be here too? And, and at the time, uh, Moss Technologies was eager to break into the processor market. And I think they were maybe making um, calculator chips at the time. and. This is around the time that TI decided to start making their own calculators, which just kind of like filled that whole market. Um, and, and so they brought their experience from the 6800, which was the, the CPU project that they were on when they were at Motorola. And, and they brought with it some goals. So they wanted to outperform it. Uh, more importantly, they wanted to be cheaper. And most importantly, they wanted every interested engineer and hobbyist to be able to get one. So, so the first problem is how to lower the cost. And you know, for, I, I don't know a tremendous amount about CPU design, but my understanding is size is always equal to money with CPUs. 
And the, the 6502 ended up being, you know, just over 3,500 transistors. But you think about the, the, uh, the Xbox One has this sort of system on a chip design. Um, according to Wikipedia, it's about 5 billion transistors. It would be kind of interesting if they, they just packed that full of 6502s. And, and at the time, back in the 70s, uh, the defect rate for manufacturing CPUs was 70%. So the, the price that Motorola was looking at charging, the $300, was based on that 70%. So, so that means their yield was 30%. You, know? you, you build a lot of these and, and only 30% are actually usable. And so that's why their price was so high, was because you know, they, they knew they'd throw 70% of them away. Um, and this also led them to, to make the 6502 into kind of the first risk processor. Um, We'll get to, get to the design more. Um, so, the, so to handle the defect rate, um, right, so the, the CPUs back then were, were designed by hand, and, and they had these like great big tables, and they had this material called rubolith, and, and they would have layout engineers kind of cut, cut the material to create traces, and, and you could crawl around on these tables. I've read stories that, you know, People would need to wear clean socks, like new clean socks, because they didn't want their toenails to, to like cut the rubolith. Um, and, and so they would take this giant image from this table, and they'd shrink it down to something that's like, I don't know, maybe a centimeter by a centimeter. And, and so they would do this kind of photo reduction process that's analogous to if you had a large thing and you used a photocopier to shrink it down. And if you're familiar with that process, you end up with all kinds of artifacts, like just any imperfection in the scanning and then printing and scanning and printing and scanning and printing just magnifies, right? So the, the thing that Moss did that was really kind of innovative in the time was they, they would actually, after each step uh, in, the, in the photo reduction, they would somehow clarify the image again. And um, I haven't been able to figure out how they did that. If somebody knows, that would be really interesting details. But they were able to invert the, the uh, yield ratio. So they went from that 70% failure rate down to uh, 30%, which gave them 70% success. And they had one other secret weapon. Um, so Bill Mensch, the, the, one of the engineers who, who left Motorola, is um, kind of known for being this legendary layout engineer. So back in those days, you, you would do the, the layout, and I think the average was like eight or nine iterations of uh, laying out a particular design and then trying to build one uh, and then use it before you actually got one that worked. So that would be like, uh, we did the design and you know, there's some human error, like uh, you know, I, I got the ALU completely wrong, or um, you know, the photo reduction process just went completely bonkers and, and you know, we had to start over from scratch. Um, so Bill actually designed um, something like seven different CPUs that were that all worked on the first try, which like I, I don't think anybody else has gotten that to happen once. And and so him getting it right on the first try also saved Moss a whole bunch of money on the the R and D for this. Here's actually a picture. I think I think these layout engineers are at uh, Bell Labs, um, but that's them uh, cutting the the ruby lith and. I, I don't know what they're actually designing. Um, maybe those are registers connected to a bus. All right, so I made the claim that it was a risk processor, but the term hadn't even been invented yet. Uh, the reason I say that is because the, the addressing modes um, were, were simplified compared to something like the 6800. Um, I'm not sure what it means that the, the three-state control of the bus was removed. I don't know that much about CPU architectures. Um, that's a point I've seen people make. Uh, they only had 56 instructions, and, and that even included the, the sort of non-essential BCD instructions, which maybe back in the day BCD was um, pretty important. I, I always think it's kind of silly, but the, the nice thing about it, if you're not familiar with it, it's binary coded decimals, and so if you added you know, hexadecimal nine and uh, hexadecimal two, uh, what it would compute is you know, hexadecimal 11, which isn't arithmetically the right answer, but if you were maybe uh, had some way to, to see these numbers or you're just printing them out in hex, they, they, would, you know, they would be base 10 correct. 
Um, it also had very few registers. So of course it had the, the program counter and a stack pointer, but it only had three general purpose registers. So it had the accumulator, um, X register and Y register, and then just the eight bit um, CPU status, like you know, uh, a carry flag and things like that. Uh, the the A, X, and Y are, are nice because um, you know if you're if you're doing a nested loop, you can use X and Y as your as your loop counters. Um, so then you know if you are using those for a loop, then you really just down to your accumulator because you're not going to use the you know program counter or the stack pointer. You know, I, I don't have much experience with 6502 assembly, but. Because you have no index registers, right? Yeah. Although, although I'll, I'll, get, I'll get to what other uh, cool tricks you could do to get around the lack of registers in a minute. Um, so I don't expect you to read this. Um, but this, just to, to reemphasize the, you know, the small instruction set, this was a reference card that a programmer might use when working with the 6502 that just lists all the instructions and you know what they do to memory so that you could uh, figure out well you know if I use this instruction you know which which status flags is that going to look at and whatnot actually um, way over on the right that column is actually all the status flags oh, but I realize this is kind of unreadable all right so so some of the improvements over the 6800 it had a very very simple form of pipelining uh, maybe the first CPU to have pipelining, I'm not sure. Calling it pipelining is a bit generous, actually. So what it was was the last cycle of every instruction, um, it would go out and start fetching the next instruction. So the pipeline depth was one. You know, it's not, it's not like uh, you know, modern CPUs that are kind of executing, you know, I, I think it's 31 stages, I think, for, for like... Um, something like an i7. Okay, so to answer your question about not having registers, what you could do is zero page addressing. So in order to um, make memory accesses, kind of make certain instructions faster, and, and uh, I guess there was a number of trade-offs in effect. So another one was that RAM was just as fast as the CPU back then. Like you weren't, the CPU didn't need to wait on RAM. It could use it every cycle, because um, the RAMs are kind of faster in a sense than, than the CPUs. And so they, they used the first uh, 256 addresses as this zero page. So the instructions would have uh, an addressing mode where the, the high order byte was just zero, and you would just use the low, low byte of the address, because the addresses were 16, 16 bits. And so those instructions were shorter, so you could you know, fetch and decode them faster. But they could still uh, indirect through the, the zero page. So you could load the zero page, with you know 128 16-bit addresses, and then indirect through those addresses. So you kind of then had 128 registers to play with. And yeah, because the instructions were shorter, it ended up being faster than indirecting through other parts of memory. Because you know the the cycle, like how long a particular instruction takes on a 6502 is really about how how many how many times you need to go fetch something. Is, is really most of what it comes down to. And the instructions, I think there's a minimum instruction uh, time of two clock cycles, and the maximum, I think, is uh, six or seven. Uh, another, another perk was, you know, because they brought the 6800 experience, programmers trained on the 6800, transitioned to the 6502 fairly well. And uh, because of this kind of pipelining, pipelining thing they had going on and the much simpler design, I, I think they were getting out, I think it was about four instructions for every instruction the 6800 uh, could, could crank out, even though the clocks were about the same, same speed. All right, so they, they were able to achieve their goal. You know, remember back in the beginning I said the customer kept saying like, oh, $25 for a CPU would be perfect. And, and they uh, debuted it for about $20. Um, the, the trade show that it was at, um, I, I've heard different accounts, but I think it was 20 or 25. Uh, that would be about $80, $80 after inflation, and then you could get the instruction manual for another 10. Um, and, and it was a huge success. 
So at the, the, trade show, the trade show they debuted at, they had like this wooden barrel full of samples for people and they ran out of samples. And at first people were, were sort of doing the, the napkin math and they're like, well, today's yields, there's no way, this, is, this has to be like this cheap imitation of the 6800 that's never actually going to work. But uh, Intel and Motorola were both there and kind of freaked out by this you know, $20 competitor. So they dropped the prices on theirs, which I'll talk about that more. But that validated this CPU. And, and then everybody at the trade show went, oh, this is real because Intel and Motorola are actually worried. Um, all right, so, so then, yeah, Motorola's reaction. So by now, this is 1975, and Motorola has, you know, after Chuck and those other engineers left, kind of realized, oh, we, maybe we screwed up. Like, we should reorganize our semiconductor division. And um, they also, so Moss was really excited about getting into the, the market, and they, they kind of wanted things to be uh, compatible with the 6800, but, you know, they, they were kind of also being careful not to step on too many toes because they had a different instruction set and whatnot. But they, did, they still made a mistake. They made their CPU pin compatible with the 6800, and Motorola was able to use that uh, as grounds to sue them. So in today's dollars, it was just under a million dollars when they finally settled out of court. Um, and at that trade show, so the 6800 was originally $300. By the time the trade show happened, I think it had dropped in price to like 180. But then, you know, as soon as they saw the price on the 6502, they dropped it all the way to 70, which is kind of interesting. Because they must have been, uh, you know, losing money at that point because their yields were still at the, you know, 30% yield. All right, so I, I said that it enabled the PC revolution. I don't know if you can recognize these machines, but the first one is an Apple. Hopefully you can tell. Uh, the one to its right is the Apple II. And some of these machines didn't have the original 6502. They might have had like a, a modified, like a revised CPU or um, something like that. This, this one down here is the BBC Micro. Um, I don't know if any of you had one of those. I think they were... Uh, you know, not very popular in the U.S. And uh, the Commodore 64 down there, the, the Commodore 128, um, the PET and the VIC-20 and a few others also had modified 6502 CPUs. Um, and then in, in the 80s, uh, the, the console, like the video game console industry kind of took off after um, things kind of... Uh, I don't know how many people know this, but in, I think it was about 1983, um, Atari was kind of letting anybody make video games, and it just kind of killed their platform because there were horrible games like E.T. that, that were <laughs> totally unplayable. And Nintendo came along, and, and they have some interesting history too. Um, they said only licensed developers and uh, kind of revitalized the whole market by by having tight control over who could make games and and that created a you know a, a, a marketplace where legitimate game developers who were dumping tons of resources into making high quality games could succeed the Super Nintendo doesn't have a true 6502 um, it has a it has the successor which um, is called the uh, 65 C 816 or something because it's got um, kind of a compatibility mode, which is the 8, and then it's also got 16-bit ALU, which is the, the newer stuff. The other thing about the Nintendo, uh, its version of the 6502, uh, Moss had licensed it to Rico, and uh, Re uh, Nintendo didn't want to pay the BCD patents, and so Rico looked at the, the um, I don't know, I guess the, the traces of the, the actual CPU, and they said, you know, if we cut that line right there, That'll deactivate all the BCD hardware, and you won't have to pay the patents. And Nintendo said, yeah, okay. And, and so the, the Nintendo has a 6502 without BCD. All right, so you might be thinking, wow, you know, they were wildly successful. All those computers, you know, uh, back in the 80s had, you know, in the 70s and the 80s had 6502s and, um, you know, it was used in the video game consoles. It, you know, Moss made a, must have made a killing. Well, actually, uh, I don't think they were so good at business decisions. Uh, you know, and getting sued for $200,000 by Motorola really hurt. So they were acquired by Commodore and rebranded to the Commodore Semiconductor Group. That rebranding actually took a while to happen because they didn't want to have to like, reprint all their manuals. 
Um, ten bucks each, right? Yeah, yeah. That's uh, it's a big deal back then, apparently, because uh, it was uh, twenty dollars yeah, scaled up to eighty. Yeah, so it was about forty ball, forty dollars per manual. Um, and eventually, uh, in I think it was about ninety four, ninety five, Commodore. Um, went bankrupt and they got split up and, you know, uh, Gateway, I think, took a large chunk of their IP. But um, the, the original uh, management, I, th I think the original Moss management, I'm a little bit unclear about this, um, formed a company called GMT Microelectronics and bought CSG and sort of like kind of became Moss again is the way I, I understand it. But they, they had a bit of a problem. So their um, factory uh, was uh, kind of in kind of gross uh, violation of environmental uh, things. So I, I'm not sure exactly what was going on there. Like maybe, um, maybe it was an accident with like something leaking. And anyway, the EPA shut them down and decided to liquidate them. So they're, they're not around at all. Um, Bill Mensch uh, went on to found the Western Design Center and um, he, he refined the 6502 design into uh, the 65CO2. The, the C is for compatibility. Um, it's, it's got some bugs fixed. There's this kind of rare um, uh, bug with the jump instruction where um, if, if there's, when it's calculating the, the new address, uh, it, if it carries in a certain way, it'll actually uh, pull, pull data from the wrong place on, on the bus. And he fixed that bug. And, and a few other things. And uh, he, he's also the one that designed the CPU that, that went into the Super NES. Um, uh, what else can I say about that? I think, I think he has a design. Wikipedia claims it's the only CPU that's ever been sort of certified for use in a pacemaker. And it's based on the 6502. Um, I've, I've heard that these, uh, the, 60, the 65CO2s are still being made, I think, their sales are like 20 million a year, and like they find their ways into cars and other random things like that. Do you know how much they cost now? I don't. That would be interesting to find out. Uh, all right, so I promised you lessons. Uh, what, what can we learn about the 6502 and its success? So I think the, you know, what we can learn from Chuck and his experience with Motorola is that you should really listen to your customers. You know, if they're all kind of saying, you know, $25 would be perfect, um, that there's really something to that. Uh, and from Motorola's perspective, they really should have listened to Chuck and, and, you know, said, well, you know, how can you do this for $25 instead of, you know, there's no way, get out of here, which seemed to be what they were saying. Um, and I think he was absolutely right that everyone should have access. So, you know, if you're making um, you know, some, some product these days, like, you know, uh, 3D printing is getting big, right? So I think this is a goal that the 3D printing people should have is like, you know, let's make a $25 3D printer. Even if it's not great, like, let's get it in every hobbyist's hands so that they can, you know, play with it and, and kind of come up with cool ideas and, and really make it take off. Uh, also, though, the, you know, the elegance of the design was really important, right? Because they were able to, to uh, dramatically increase their yield. Uh, and also, it was much smaller and simpler. I, I don't know how many transistors in the 6800, but you know, 3,500 3, transistors is is pretty good. Uh, it was, and that also made it easier to optimize. You know, you, you find this in programming too, right? That a lot of times, the simpler code, you can actually understand what's going on, and you know, playing with it in your profiler or whatever, go, oh yeah, that's what's really eating up all the time, and then and then optimize it. Uh, and then from, from Moss's experience with getting acquired multiple times and, and eventually getting shut down, um, you know, just uh, it takes more than a great product to run a business. You know, I, I can build interesting things, but I certainly have no idea about business sense. Um, and there's a, there's a group out there now uh, at visual6502.org who they've, they've, taken, they've taken real chips and, and they, like, uh, use sulfuric acid or something to, to burn off the layers. And then they take a really high resolution microscope and they take a picture and then they burn off another layer and take another picture. And they can actually reconstruct the, the transistors and, and all their layout from that. And they, they use some you know, interesting computer algorithms. Um, I think they published a SIGGRAPH paper on some of that stuff. And then they, they wrote it, so then they were able to reverse engineer the net list. 
And the net list allows them then to write um, a, a simple to verify but very low level simulator that just simulates the flow of cur current around the net list. And then they can kind of emulate a 6502 very accurately, you know, sort of unintended instructions. So there were, there were all the sort of documented instructions that I showed you before, all 56 of them. But there were interesting combinations that you could sort of send certain bit patterns and parts of the ALU might still work. And they were able to figure out that, yeah, that's basically what's going on is that the un unexpected instructions were just in, like, it tried to interpret them, it tried to execute them. It didn't do anything special by saying, well, that's a no-op because I don't recognize it. Um, but I, I recommend their website, it's, it's very cool stuff. Uh, there are simulators in JavaScript, so you can actually load it up and play with it, you know, right from your browser. And this is an image I got from their website. Um, th this, this is the sort of all the layers put back together. Um, I, I don't know how well you can see it, but we've got, so the decoder logic is at the top. Um, the actual like ALU logic is in the middle and then all the registers are down below. Uh, it's pretty cool stuff. Anyway, that's all I had for you. So what 6502 emulators are available in this project? Um, so I, I've only really looked at the ones that emulate like the NES or the Super NES. Um, so I really only, uh, I'm really only familiar with those ones. Um, but I found that Nintendulator is the one that um, everybody sort of says, this one's really accurate for the NES. Um, I don't know, that's probably more because the NES had a bunch of additional circuitry for doing audio and video. So it had this picture processing unit, which is kind of hard to understand and reverse engineer. I, I think their picture processing unit's probably like, twice as big as the 6502 in terms of transit count. The, the chip was used in a lot of arcade machines, so the arcade emulators like the will have the implementation to check out. So uh, more from the other implementations that, are, that have uh, an interface you can do some assembly code experimentation against uh, easily? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what you mean. Um, like ready, ready to uh, actually program and, and uh, do, do you mean real hardware or do you mean uh, emulators? Like emulators, just chip emulators that I could uh, write some machine code against. Right, so the 65, or sorry, visual6502.org has um, the, the simulator that's in their browser, um, you can use it for that. It runs, uh, I think there's a C version you can download, which is still a bit slower than the real CPU was, you know, because it was like four megahertz and I think the C program runs around one megahertz depending on how fast your computer is. Um, so if you want a really high fidelity simulation, you know, you can use those. Um, but yeah, there's, it's pretty easy to get a hold of an emulator for it. I, I wrote one that was, um, I wrote it in Haskell and it was just like at a functional level, like I didn't do anything with cycles or making sure that, you know, instructions simulated the right amount of uh, cycle length or anything like that. Um, but it was pretty easy. I mean, just like doing it in the evenings for like a week or two and I, I had something that I could run basic programs on. You know, just really simple, sort of. Are you familiar with what other addressing mode besides that zero page mode? What other addressing mode that? Yeah, so you could, you could specify a 16-bit address, and you could also, um, uh, you could either uh, have, have that instruction uh, reference, um, yeah, so, so you could, you, so, in addition to the indirect ones through the zero page, which is just using an 8-bit address, you could also indirect through a full 16-bit address. And then you, you, know, you have immediate mode sort of addressing sort of things. I guess it's not really addressing, but. Was the X register, is that, was that an offset register for certain instructions to use that? You know, I, that sounds right, but yeah, so, right. I think you can use it for, um, if, if you had a 16-bit address loaded into the zero page at a particular address, you could, yeah, you could use the, the X register to sort of go through memory by, by adding that X to whatever is, uh, th whatever address is in the zero page. Yeah, and I think that's probably in real programs, that's probably a pretty common technique. So, any other questions? All right, thank you.